Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the executive director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk, Legacies of Genocide, Mauthausen and its Memorialization, features Dr. Rebecca Rovit, Associate Professor of Theater at the University of Kansas. Dr. Rovis, Rovit will explore how Mauthausen concentration camp is a site of remembrance connected to violence that permeated Austrian soil by the Nazis during World War II. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College in Bayside, New York, is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and indigenous communities. Today's event is part of the 2022-23 KHC and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Trauma, Remembrance, and Compassion. It's also connected to our newest virtual and in-person exhibition, The Concentration Camps, Inside the Nazi System of Incarceration and Genocide. Our event today is co-sponsored by the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center, the Ray Walpole Institute at Western Washington University, and the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University. One housekeeping note, please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jody Vanderhorn Gibson, one of this year's KHC NEH faculty fellows. Dr. Vanderhoor Gibson is an associate professor in the Department of Communication, Theater, and Media Production at Queensborough Community College. She received her PhD in theater from Arizona State University and has taught a broad range of theater, film, and communication courses in the New York City region. Her research focuses primarily on representations of race and gender in pop culture, as well as developing equitable and inclusive practices for the classroom. She has presented her research widely at international conferences and national ones, and has had published her work in theater, film, and communication. Dr. Vanderhorn Gibson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I just want to take a brief moment to inter, uh, introduce our guest speaker for the day. Um, Rebecca Rovid is an associate professor of theater at the University of Kansas, where she teaches courses in script analysis, theater history, and cultural memory at the undergraduate and graduate levels. She is currently a J. William Fulbright Specialist for Theater and Genocide in the category of Peace and Conflict Resolution Studies, and that has been from 2018, and it will be through uh, 2023. Dr. Rovid's experience on the cultural heritage of the Holocaust shows in her microhistory, the Jewish Kulturbund Theater Company in Nazi Berlin 2012, and co-edited theatrical performance during the Holocaust, published in 1999. Her publications on theater performance appear in such journals as the Performing Arts Journal, the, the Drama Review, Theater Survey, Theater History Studies, um, the Journal of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and she was the editor of the Journal of Dramatic Theory and Criticism from 2015 through 2018. Dr. Rovid has received fellowships from the ACLS, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, the American Philosophical Society, DAAD, and the J. William Fulbright Scholarship Board and Austrian American Education Commission. She's currently working on a new book on post-World War II theater in Berlin and Vienna under micro, excuse me, multinational occupation called Theater from the Rubble of War, 1945 through 1955. We welcome you, Dr. Rovit, um, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon. And Jody, thank you for your gracious introduction. And for all of you out there connecting across multiple time zones and uh, spaces, thank you for being here. I'm honored to participate in today's colloquium. My fellow speakers uh, have addressed the fragility of Holocaust memory, 
especially once the last survivors are gone. Uh, they've spoken of our own vulnerability in feeling for others when hearing trauma-laden accounts of life in the camps by witnesses whose live testimonies have been preserved after their death in holograms. Well, how do we turn empathy into action to move toward compassion from those whose suffering doesn't belong to us? Uh, today, I'd like to build on what previous guests have voiced about those of us who came after the Holocaust as secondary or even tertiary witnesses to atrocity. What about those of us who belong to what scholar Diana I. Petescu calls the post-witness generation? That is the generation for whom the Holocaust legacy is not part of our living memory, but rather belongs to what the author refers to as a culturally and politically mediated memory work promoted by post-witness generations. This includes Gen X, Y, and Z, whose memories are at a general remove or more from that of Holocaust survivors or their next of kin. In other words, as the gap between the lived memory of the Shoah and our present widens, how do we maintain the urgency of remembrance for later generations? I'm going to uh, put my uh, screen on now so I can uh, show you uh, what my uh, talk is about. So please bear with me for a few seconds. So uh, to iterate, um, what I wanna do today is examine our role as post-witnesses to genocide I'll draw on experiential and intergenerational aspects of memory based on an excursion I co-led in 2019 to the Nazi concentration camp Mauthausen with a group of 28 graduate students from the University of Vienna in Austria. How does the power of place and the landscape affect us at a site-specific memorial that was once a concentration camp? Do we have an ethical responsibility towards such violated spaces? What legacy have those spaces created for me as an American born Jew and my students whose descendants may have had a role in perpetrating crimes against humanity? I'll address such questions as I explore how Mauthausen represents a site of remembrance connected to the swift submission by Austrians to Hitler's Reich in 1938 and to the resulting terror that engulfed the land by looking at landscape as a memorial to historical atrocity. Perhaps we may engage productively in remembrance for future generations, even as we feel emotionally exposed in the process. My exploration draws on work by cultural memory scholars like Astrid Erl, Aleda Osman, Lori Beth Clark, and Dylan Trigg, and longstanding ideas in performance studies, specifically environmental theater, where performers and spectators negotiate place as they move within given and created spaces. Consider the reflexivity of performative behavior at the camp. Mine, as an American professor of theater, and that of my Vienna-based theater and film students. How might cultural differences alter our perceptions of the former camp memorial in our 21st century? I interweave my reflections with those of my students whom I anonymize to reveal our role as active spectators within spaces of Mauthausen past and present. Picture this, a rooster crows in the hills high above the Danube, its call resounding through the Austrian countryside. I stand inside the former concentration camp at its perimeter. As I survey the landscape, does my knowledge of what happened at Mauthausen affect the pastoral view? Or do the holes in the chain link fence arrest the scene before me? The proximity of farmhouses to the site of past horror stuns me. In the cool breeze, I 
hear the rustling of leaves, the still beauty of the late May afternoon clashes with the sight of plunging depth toward the stone quarry below. There must be more than 100 steps hewn into the forested rock face from which many a prisoner once plummeted from exhaustion or sport when an SS officer reveled in the cruelty of the punishment. The passage of time has hushed the once audible screams and shouts, but the ghosted quiet of dis the ghosted echo of disquiet nonetheless haunts the senses. The stairs of death are no longer the rub blood stained stairs that exploited slave labor. They were smoothed out in post-war renovations. Yet their jagged pastness pierce our present, and the palpable drop amplifies in space the memory of a torturous flight into the abyss. I stand speechless alongside a local guide with a muted group of students who accompanied me on the two and a half hour journey to Upper Austria. We listen in silence to a place where the bucolic terrain of grazing animals muffles the cacophonic terror of national socialism. How do we recognize the enormity of what Mauthausen means to us more than 75 years after its liberation? My snapshot suggests the relationship between natural and public space and the jarring fusion of past and present as active participants at the camp's sprawling site we embodied remembrance commemorating the Holocaust past, although from different histories and viewpoints. Mauthausen is a memorial site in Austria since 1949, belongs to the German and Austrian cultural legacy of war. Yet four generations of post-World War II Austrians like my students, the camp and its memorialization was proof of a victimhood doctrine rooted in an established wartime narrative that prevailed until 1988. In Germany, however, over time, Mauthausen came to represent evil incarnate. The memorialization of Mauthausen after 1945 thus joins cultural and political history in Germany and Austria. It connects Austrians to the 1938 annexation, but also to the 1943 Moscow Treaty, whose declaration on Austria claimed the nation a first victim of Hitler's aggression and the annexation null and void. The signatories expected the country once liberated to bear responsibility for its collaboration with Germany. That process is ongoing. Inherent in performance is the repetition of behavior as performance theorist Richard Schechner has long documented. Just as performance is never for the first time, so too do acts of remembrance engage us in thinking about something again, involving our restored behavior as we perform our connection to the past. Our movements are central to our everyday mediation of space and place as we embody temporal historical spaces, much uh, modalities of time and space, as Schechner writes. Our visit to the former concentration camp represented a continued effort by a new generation of Austrians who grapple with family history, collective identity, and national responsibility connected to Mauthausen and World War II. Collective memory fulfills the needs of the group in the present not the past. The memorial site with its quarry is embedded in its surrounding landscape of rolling hills and farmland. The topography of the former camp lends physical and mental structure for memories that reach back nearly 85 years imbued with traces from the war. Tens of thousands of prisoners uh, from over 30 countries were murdered within the Mauthausen complex. Their voices stifled. In 2022, however, 
The names of former inmates have been spoken aloud, etched in stone, and digitized in medial tributes to the dead. Every May, survivors return to the camp in what musicologists might call a sonic performance or a commemorative reenactment to remember what Mauthausen once was and how it came to be. Mauthausen was conceived as a labor camp for political prisoners who didn't support Hitler's causes. The first group of prisoners transferred from Dachau in nearby Bavaria built the camp in 1938. Later deportees included Jews, Roma Sinti, and prisoners from over 30 nations. Mauthausen with its 40 subcamps thus developed as a premier hub of support for the war effort, supplying slave labor and armaments to the Reich while boosting its economy through the camp network and foray to private industry. By nature of its preserved state, the camp memorializes historical captivity and brutality. Its expanded spaces include a museum and an education center, an international memorial park with sculptures dedicated to each nation that lost civilians at the camp lies adjacent to the secluded spot near the fence where our group stood. The camp with the original gas chamber, albeit renovated doors, crematoria and the notorious stairs of death to the quarry serves as a pilgrimage site for a variety of travelers like us in search of moral reckoning or spiritual recovery or the thrill. Lori Beth Clark, who writes about trauma tourism, specifically refers to the dark tourism that engages us with sites of death as ethical spaces. She suggests that site-specific memorials provide us with a unique opportunity to engage ethically beyond ourselves. She asks whether certain spaces are so heavily violated that they must be preserved and made into memorials for all of futurity. Well, between 1938 and 1945, a camp like Mauthausen was an actual site of violation, desecrated and rendered profane by its function in abusing and exploiting people as slave laborers. Clark writes of historical trauma that it is the inhumanity of the atrocity that severs the trauma site from its human surroundings. On our initial ascent to the medieval market town of Mauthausen, the looming brown stone walls and watchtowers of the former camp elicited a powerful emotional response, revealing material remains of the camp's role in the Nazi killing machine. The citadel with prison-like features is visible from below and across the surrounding farms. The place appears somehow fundamentally unreal, even mythic, and yet it's terribly real, even iconic. The massive structure arrests the eye and the soul. Its intrusive presence juxtaposes rough, dark rock within the otherwise green countryside. Some memory scholars agree that the topography of national memory comprises a geography of belonging. Physical geography intensifies the belonging as well as detachment. At Mauthausen, we experienced a rupture in time and space caught between the past and present. My students sensed a placelessness or suspension of time and space as they absorbed the somatic effects of being on site at the former camp. One student whom I'll call Martina recalled with elegant insight, our bodies, relatively new and untouched by such traumatic events were moving across the landscape of this complex that is hard to grasp for us now in a totally different manner than those who lived through these terrible times. I felt in our group the desperate need to look, to understand, to imagine the horrors that took place. And this also is what remembering is about, understanding why and how something happened and connected to our 
present. In our 21st century, a former concentration camp with its persistent spatio-temporality of trauma evokes history and the cultural memory of that history. According to Errol, cultural memory encompasses a retrospective construction related to our present situation and thereby engages such modes of remembrance as myth, religious memory, political history, trauma, and generational memory. Other scholars remind us that history engages our present for them. Memory narratives are formed by multiple voices. The contestation of what happened in the past, however, often revolves around who or, or what is entitled to speak for the past in the present. And this is how our guided tour at Mauthausen began in earnest. The 28 of us divided into two groups for what would be many hours in the camp, led by train guides from the memorial site. Adam Schmidberger led my group of 14 to a seminar room located outside of the camp's inner walls. Schmidberger is a local Austrian in his 30s whose grandparents owned a farm in nearby Gusen during World War II. He openly spoke to us of his family's interactions with SS officers and of prisoners who escaped from the camp seeking refuge at the family farm. His familial ties to the immediate region would make our tour through the camp's grounds more intimate. But then it was our turn to speak. What do we have to do with this period of time, Schmiedberger asked us. How did we see ourselves in connection with the Third Reich and Mauthausen? We sat in a circle sharing why we joined the excursion and what we knew about the camp before our visit. Was it I or the students who seemed awkward when I said I was Jewish and had lost relatives in the Holocaust? Two students are non-Austrians. One is a Taiwanese-born naturalized Canadian studying in Austria. He wants to better understand his classmates' viewpoints about dictatorship as he's sensitive to government crackdowns and autocracy in Asia. The other is a German, only too aware of his country's perilous historical slide into fascism. Most of the students, ages 23 to 28, had already visited Mauthausen or Dachau with a school group. Two had been to Auschwitz-Birkenau. A handful mentioned great-grandparents who served in the Wehrmacht. One young woman vividly describes how her grandmother recounted seeing Russian prisoners of war march through her village in eastern Austria toward Mauthausen. Yet another recalls her boarding school located next door to a former camp for forced laborers. More than half of the students nodded when a peer mentioned the silence at home regarding their great grandparents' histories in World War II. All voiced how vital it is for them as young Austrians to engage in remembrance work. Our guide deepened our critical engagement with interactive ex exercises on a white note board. He drew columns with colored markers, perpetrator, victim, and environment. We associated buzzwords with uh, these terms in categories like concentration camp, gas chamber, uh, day of liberation, guilt, Deportation and survival, what did the day of liberation mean for the perpetrator? Uh, fear, uh, jail, for example, for the survivor, uh, retribution, freedom, and for the local community, loss, uh, responsibility, perhaps. We talk about what, if any, repercussions there were for Austrians post-war. The students are honest and receptive to one another. Schmidberger used photographs from Mauthausen's past that would determine the path of our walking tour within the camp's inner walls. He placed on the floor several copies of 15 unlabeled photographs from the camp's archival collection. In pairs, we chose two to three photos. What did we see? Who was in the photo? 
what might be the context? The photos included striking images of uniformed men from SS personal albums and recreational shots of people in civilian dress like one of a woman in a car next to a visible road sign to Lager Mauthausen adorned with caricatures of uniformed guards. Another photo showed a group of men bathing in the water with onlookers, including officers, while still other photos depicted masses of people outside uh, the camp high walls, as well as drawings by inmates of in the quarry carrying stones on their backs or crowded into barracks. Each partnered group presented our selected photos and then we prepared to tour the camp. Our chosen photos defined our route as Schmidberger led us to areas on the camp's grounds where the photos likely had been taken. Mariana Hirsch has written about how traumatic memories may transfer within a social group, specifically a family group. In her work on post memory, she connects the relationship of second or third generations to what she calls powerful, almost traumatic experiences that preceded their deaths, yet uh, transmitted via memories that may not be their own. Hirsch's theory mean mainly does focus on descendants of Holocaust survivors, not relatives of perpetrators. However, we may reflect on post-memory to consider the generational reception to Mauthausen by my Austrian students. These young people voice generational memories and bear too the trauma of their country's scarred landscape. Peter Merkenböck and Helge Mosshammer, architects of the future design and restructuring of the Mauthausen Memorial site, claim that mind maps of guilt and shame are passed the generations. They believe that the new generation of Austrians is better prepared to ask about their grandparents' past. This was as I watched the students observe their surroundings and later read their reflections. Schmidtberger leads us from outside the camp's walls across a grassy expanse into the heart of the camp within the inner walls we moved through an entrance where the sight and visceral feel of barbed wire jabs my sensibilities were inside of the inside. We have no photographs of the main camp area and its prisoner barracks, the medical examination room, the disinfection area, the gas chamber and the crematoria, but our guide steers us there first. The stillness makes me catch my breath as I absorb these spaces where human beings were stripped of everything, their lives snuffed out. The students look grim. I can't bring myself to take in the horror of the gas chamber. A student, a lab busily marks our path using the Pentax camera around his neck. Later, he documents our winding route, writing, well, our first stop was around the corner outside the southeast perimeter of the camp, which now serves as additional parking for the staff. Uh, this is where we talked about the local signpost in the 1940s, uh, which pointed the directions to the camp. The signpost had caricature figures on it. it. It looked like a signpost to a theme park. I wonder why would the local town folk build the signpost that way? It, did they know what really happened within that perimeter? We entered the former concentration camp via side door, and over the right side is the former quarantine camp where prisoners spent their first week here under harsh conditions. Today, this is surrounded by a stone wall and the final resting place of nearly 3,000 prisoners whose identities remain unknown. And then we entered the infirmary building basement and went through a door that showed a sign to the gas chamber. Allah has more emotional distance than I, as he describes the window next to the entrance to the gas chamber, which he claims could have been the last thing they saw before they entered, and mentions scratches of fingernails on walls and ceiling as the last traces of life. It's easier to behold memorial plaques and a digital memorial, the room of names, with the names of those who perished, 
I'm relieved to walk upstairs to exit. Then we find ourselves in the former's prisoner realm near the barracks in the roll call square, the Appellplatz. We walk beyond the SS headquarters toward the park at the edge of the campgrounds where we peered past the stairway to the quarry below. Andrea collapses the time frames of present with the past as she ponders the closeness of neighboring villagers to the camp. I didn't expect a place like this to be that visible. Uh, people must have known when they looked up here what building this is and what it used to be before. I find it quite surreal and contradicting that a fortress like this can even in such a calm and beautiful landscape. We arrived at the stone quarry, quarry and once more, shocking, it's shocking to see houses in the landscape around the camp. The owners must have had a perfect view on how the prisoners were treated and also killed by throwing them over the edge. Aleda Osman in her examination of trauma and the Holocaust addresses how commemorative sites through their topography bring moments of the past into the present spatially and temporally, her insights are relevant for Mauthausen. She describes traumatic sites as palimpsests, multi-layered places where the time never stands still and whose effective power, she writes, is generated by perspectives formed by individual and collective of an event. Such anchored places, she states, exist in the space between authenticity and performance, between retention and reconstruction. Our group understands this in between this as we walk the camp. Cultural geography and those who study it uh, remind us that symbolic lands landscapes may serve as mnemonic devices, as what they call storage vessels of cultural identity and information and spatial anchors for historical traditions. Moreover, Lori Beth Clark explicates the commemorative power of place, suggesting how sites where violence occurred are often, quote, sustained by their network of social connections to victims, survivors, and members of politically or ethically allied communities, end quote. We see this at Mauthausen, where a memorial park extends from the former administrative SS barracks. More than 20 sculptures dedicated to a multitude of victim groups, including nations across Europe and Israel, honor their citizens who were imprisoned at the camp. We may reflect on how the hilltop camp evokes the interconnected realms of forgetting and remembrance, creating an extensive memorial landscape whose cues we reinterpret for our times while complicating the original setting. Our group ends the tour on a grassy area beneath the parkland under the stone rampart at the front of the camp complex. Nearby lay the Russian infirmary camp, a makeshift encampment for Soviet prisoners of war, many of whom died on the meadow. Not far from there, the uh, Sportplatz below the fortress, SS officers once played soccer against a civilian team from the town of Mauthausen after the US military liberated the camp, May 1945, Austrian locals were ordered to the Sportplatz to dig graves and bury the bodies of victims. This information hit our group hard as Martina made clear, recalling how walking through the camp gives rise to the realization you are figuratively walking across the dead bodies or rather skeletons of over 14,000 people. This manifested where our group arrived at the former soccer field where once a mass grave was dug by SS soldiers, I noticed a certain chilling feeling where the thought of us standing above hundreds of graves was absolutely frightening. 
In fact, our guide told us that we were at a good distance from the former mass grave and the bodies had been removed. But we stand on the old soccer field with black and white photos trying to match our present view to the past. It's off kilter. As Trigg reminds us, peculiar to the spatial memory of trauma is the role ruins play in housing what is absent. Such a mentally altered form testifies to the negative spatiality of the ruin, he says, and ultimately to their significance. No traces of mass graves remain. We see only the regenerating environment against which we hold the photographs. By now, we've spent nearly six hours at the camp inhabiting the space which we re-embodied through our remembrance of cruelty, calamity, and courage. My students have learned something about themselves and by extension their families as they faced an uneasy past that binds them. Perhaps it was my German student who most succinctly summed up why the visit was vital for his generation and the ones to come. Max admitted to feeling anxious as our bus neared Mauthausen. He knew that his visitors were at a great remove from what inmates experienced our feeling while intense is nowhere near to what prisoners suffered. However, as he put it, to visit a place like Mauthausen can help us to connect our experiences to the historical context this is why it's so important that sites like the former camp are maintained. They thereby become more than just a memory of atrocities related to national socialism. Above all, they preserve potential fellow feeling for future generations. Our ride back to Vienna took place in almost complete silence, each of us sifting Together, fragments of the past with our present moment, I learned that the other half of our large group toured the camp in a different sequence than we had. They chose different photographs at the outset, and their guide was not a local inhabitant. Each separate group dynamic, together with our respective communal steps, created different paths for our remembrance, as well as differing responses to the landscape we left behind. Through our engagement with the site of past trauma and its memorialization, we began to tap questions of witness and healing, remembering and forgetting, and presence and erasure. Mauthausen presents a compelling example of a site whose commemorative role for posterity conjoins enduring discourses about history and public mem memory making related to the Holocaust the post-World War II years, and our 21st century. Thank you, and thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rovit, that, for that just truly powerful accounting um, of that experience that you and your your class uh, not classmates your students had um I had I mean I have a I don't know that I have a couple of questions to start us but I do have just a couple of thoughts that came up that maybe you could speak a little bit on um I was very taken with the notion of your German student Max I believe you said his name was and his reflection on you know the the importance of um of remembering the importance of or or the act of our remembering brings life, it brings honor, it brings remembrance. But I'm curious as to um in that in that narrative of his, you were reflecting then too on the absolute silence of the ride home. So I'm just curious because one of the things that we've talked about um with my engagement with the KHC over the past few years is really this this concept of taking students in and then taking students out like as you were doing your presentation and you were talking about giving the example of the fingernails like I, I yeah I'm glad my camera and my my uh volume my I was muted like literally gaps like that took the air out of my lungs so I'm just wondering like 
what was the process for you in terms of prepping your students for this kind of thing? And then past the ride home with the silence of the ride, like, could you talk a little bit maybe about the processing both going in and going out um, of, of what you and your students did? Uh, I, I certainly will try. And, and, and first uh, to Mox, who uh, has a different name. Uh, Mox was uh, especially, uh, I feel that in some ways he felt that he shouldered even more mm. uh, of the weight of, uh, of his German descendants, uh, even though we, we know quite well of the collaboration. But these narratives uh, continue in both countries to uh, shape uh, conversations that even great grandchildren are having. Mm. Um, I uh, I should point out uh, just some um, some uh, quick details about uh, the tour. I uh, met some of these students for the very first time early in the morning at Schönbrunn, where we boarded a bus in Vienna to go to Mauthausen. However, uh, because then uh, it it my class had not yet begun. However, uh, I had uh, already prepared a an ele you know electronic platform uh, the uh, and there were there was another class that a sort of collaborator of mine in Vienna at the university uh, was teaching already that had um, already begun and therefore there were 28 students and they weren't all in my class that began in June mm. uh, so I had uh, so the uh, number one the Excursion was optional. It cost money, although we were able to get funds from the University of Vienna to help actually hire a bus driver uh, and to uh, thereby also uh, put in some money to make it more easy for students to afford the excursion. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the preparation um, on my website, I had some readings. Uh, for them, uh, they knew in advance, this was optional, that in effect, uh, in my class, we'd be using uh, the city of Vienna and its extended uh, landscape or cityscape as a site of remembrance over, over layers. And uh, in that way, uh, I had very little contact with them until we boarded the bus in the morning. I think people uh, were uh, a little anxious. Uh, I think uh, these students are in many ways uh, really carrying forward, especially students who would sign up for courses oh. on genocide and uh, <laughs> and theatrical activity uh, during World War II and things like that. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, we had obviously time to speak with one another, but our groups of roughly 14 were divided for almost the entire day, uh, the very first part of the trip, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, sat together and learned uh, a few details and this type of thing, went through the education center uh, and then into our rooms. So the bus ride home, I think was quiet uh, because people were exhausted mm -hmm. physically and mentally. Uh, and um, I noticed I had the urge first to sort of go through the aisles and say, are you doing okay? Uh, but I, I refrained um, also for cultural reasons, mm -hmm. uh, because there was obviously just the desire to kind of be alone or with one another or <laughs> check their messages or what <laughs> have you. Uh, and so I too needed time to reflect and some downtime uh, and so that is why their reflections came after the trip. Mm. And then I actually went into the other class as well as mine uh, to start a conversation maybe two weeks after this. A okay. long answer to your question. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm also curious, uh, we were talking a little bit about this notion of trigger warnings before the, the webinar actually started. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe just differences in your experience as an educator with American students versus uh, your experience with the European students. And like, what 
or similarities or differences. I'm just really curious because like this, this notion of sort of like emotional alienation from some of these horrors that have occurred. Um, you know, as you mentioned that the little bit, maybe emotional schism of these later generations, I'm just curious as to like, what are some experiences or differences or similarities that you're finding, even if it's same generation um, across nationality and across uh, cultural differences in those ways? Well, the first thing I'll say is uh, that my Austrian students, um, at least uh, right now at this time point, uh, even, even in 2022, trigger warnings uh, are not really used mm. over there. Okay. Um, so while uh, in my class over there, we watched uh, the rather um, terrifying uh, film Night and Fog without a trigger warning, mm. it just didn't occur to me. I mean, we're in <laughs> yeah. a very different environment. If I show it here now in 2022, uh, um, I have to make clear, I did make clear over there, there's disturbing uh, material, but many of the students already knew the film, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Alain uh, René film uh, from 1955, uh, that was actually um, co-written in its screenplay by a survivor from Ma of Mauthausen, uh, Jean Carole. Uh, so, uh, so I do think that um, they are less interested in trigger warnings uh, and perhaps uh, more prepared to discuss these very difficult uh, parts of their heritage, inherited, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stories. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there's the idea of self-selection and that anybody who opted to go on the journey Right. Uh, to Mauthausen or right. to take these classes, even in this country, mm -hmm. uh, if there are studies, uh, people in Jewish studies or uh, people who want to know how can we use the arts to call attention to uh, mm -hmm. to uh, horror and atrocity and how do we do it? Um, uh, I would I would say on that level, it's kind of the same, but trigger warnings aren't or weren't a thing over mm -hmm. there. Um, I think safe spaces, the whole attitude towards safe spaces, at least uh, in the sampling of students that I dealt with, uh, is is not on, uh, on par uh, mm. with what I see at many of our universities, especially here in the Midwest. Okay, all right. And then, um, forgive me if you said this and I missed it, the, uh, it, the, the trip itself was optional. Um, how, what was the full body of students versus the amount of students that opted in to do the trip? I'm just curious as to the mm -hmm. number. Let's see. Uh, I think, frankly, um, the uh, class that my colleague, Dr. Dallinger, was teaching on uh, partly that, that kind of coincided with mine and that we then came together. I think she had about 28 students. They have a very large MA program. Uh, at the university, and there were some PhDs in, I believe, as well. Uh, and my group uh, was closer to 11 or 12, so, you know, 40 students. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess uh, that tells you. But again, I, I will say one of the things that we find in Europe, as you likely uh, can imagine, is that many of the school trips both in Germany as well as in Austria when uh, when kids are much younger than here. Many school trips uh, and uh, educational programs uh, teach about the Holocaust and bring students mm. to Mauthausen in Austria uh, or, as I say, to, to Dachau and, of course, uh, also to Auschwitz and other mm. German camps for people like Max uh, who you know, came from elsewhere. Right. Uh, so that's just not really a thing here, as you know, right. <laughs> from <laughs> the exposure I, our students get. Much, much deeper conversation about U.S. American education, I think. <laughs> it, it's not just that. It's also yeah. uh, the location. I mean, the war, World okay. War II, World War yeah. I was fought over there. And uh, there are just 
layers and layers right, right. of um, traces or absences mm -hmm. related to uh, a whole host of traumas, right. if you will. Well, and which, which makes the act of remembering, specifically remembering the Holocaust in, you know, in the United States, so much more important because of that sort of emotional alienation and lag, as you were pointing out, like it becomes further and further removed and the less and less it's talked about, the more and more it is forgotten. Um, and so it just, just how powerful it really is to um, not to dip into like the trauma of it in a voyeuristic, you know, sensibility, but rather just like being really involved and taking action as educators to make sure that we are engaging in that act of honor, that act of memory, and that act of um, cultural resurgence, really, of just keeping that memory alive. Um, I think that's quite well said. Uh, and the verdict is out, Jody. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I do have one. I, and I just want to mention, like, please, if anyone has a question, um, I feel like Rebecca and I are having a personal conversation on the webinar here. But I did have one other question for you. Um, and then Laura, whenever Laura wants to chime in and, and take back over. I'm just also curious because you talk about perspective and so much of cultural memory um, and 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 the like keeping those things alive and and walking through those spaces, you specifically mentioned how both of your groups took different journeys. And so I'm very curious, was there a different reflection or, or as the processing happened with the students from different groups, you know, cultural mapping is of course so unique and two people from the same culture can have very different experiences. Absolutely. I was just wondering, did you see any, or, or what might have been any differences or what the experience was like because the journey was completely different from the other group? Uh, I, I think so. And um, again, uh, we were both, both groups were led by different, very trained uh, and skilled uh, and committed workers uh, and guides. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, the very short answer is that our group had Adam, Schmidberger, who, for whom this is home, because uh, Gusen is actually uh, one of the sub camps. It's very, very close. Uh, and uh, many uh, workers from Mauthausen were transferred over there and then, then to Melk and other, other places in Austria. So the fact that his family's farm was there and there were more stories to tell would engage us more than somebody who uh, is dedicated and uh, wants to make a mark on younger generations, but does becomes from you know uh, a different part of Austria right. and doesn't have quite that connection. But frankly, Austria is a very small country, mm -hmm. and since forty sub camps were spread across the country, uh, it's not you know, people people in every family would have some mm -hmm. uh, experience and contact. So uh, the, the other uh, thing that I wanted to uh, mention uh, is uh, that both of the guides made sure, I know, to take us, even though there were no photos of, you know, the inner heart that was so, uh, so dreadfully painful uh, for many of us, uh, the gas chamber and crematoria and some and the the medical examination room, et cetera. But both groups took us there first. So mm -hmm. in effect, the charting was different. But since you're involved in uh, theater and you know about narratives, mm -hmm. if you change the stops on the way, right. it changes the storyline and will indeed affect mm -hmm. how uh, how you read the route. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so so that's interesting. I will say that when I went to the other class and then uh, chatted uh, with Dr. Dallinger and um, and all of uh, my students who had been on the excursion and other walkings in the city that we talked about, I, I would say that uh, all of the students were committed and they were moved and they were moved to try to make a difference. Uh, one particular uh, student uh, in film has been going into Roma Sinti communities uh, 
mm -hmm. and uh, working with them and uh, dealing with legacies of displacement uh, and also legacies of art yeah. and trying to film that, you know, another person, you know, so, so in that way, again, these were very dedicated students who yeah. trying to make a difference for their future. Right. So, Which you mentioned at the beginning, right? So we can talk about like the 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 practice of empathy, which leads toward the act of compassion. And so looking at things that are outside of our own experience to try to connect with that empathically then leads to acts of compassion outside of our own experiences, which is so important. And I think so beautifully highlighted in your in your work and in what you're shared with us today. So Thank you okay. again. Much. Oh, okay. Are we out of time? Because I, 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 I think had... Laura's going to. No, chime no. Um, um, please, on. please add what you were going to say. What you're going to. I had one very quick anecdote about empathy, and this was spontaneous, and it was beautiful. Uh, and this is later in the summer, when uh, my students had uh, a exercise to choose an historical place, a site, either of deportation or. Um, where Hitler stood on his balcony uh, to uh, join Austrian lands to the Reich or whatever, and then write about it. And they had some readings to intersperse and theoretical kinds of readings. Uh, and at the time, there was uh, it, on, um, on the Ringstrasse a big art exhibit by a foreign photographer of Holocaust survivor portraits. They were they were large, really mm. large, and it was it was beautiful. They were lined up there to uh, kind of give them give them a life again. And yeah. uh, during uh, the night, one of the nights um, in the summer, or several nights, uh, some of them were vandalized and slashed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some Austrians went and like caretakers sat there to protect mm -hmm. the, the photographs from further vandalism. And a few of my students chose to veer off the path that they were walking, like they were going to Heldenplatz. And then it was like, no, I need to go see how those photographs mm -hmm. are doing. And 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 for me, that was such a, a horrible, beautiful mm -hmm. moment of of empathy and and caregiving and yeah. compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's really powerful what both of you have been talking about, especially how students connect, and also the difference between um, education in Europe and then education here. And, you know, I think that there's, and you also, um, Rebecca mentioned, you know, the difference between and similarities between Holocaust and genocide education. And I think that, you know, in Europe, obviously the war was fought there and the, the you know, there are 44,000 concentration camps and ghettos. Um, and there's memorials at many of them, but not all. But if you look at more recent conflicts, and I, you know, spend a lot of time looking at the Srebrenica genocide and what the um, atrocities that took place in the 1992 to 1995 Bosnian war, there's an assumption that there would be memorials for a lot of the atrocity sites, and that's simply not the case. Mm. There are buildings that have been rehabilitated that uh, are used by the community or used by the government. There are buildings that are fought over in terms of um, whether there should even be plaques. There are communities where atrocities have happened to three of the communities, and they still can't necessarily agree on what the, what the shared narrative is. Mm. Um, and, you know, the last thing I just want to say, which is what you let off with, is the power of place. Mm -hmm. At the early in the pandemic, our colleague, Dr. Carrie Lane, who's associate professor of English at Queensborough, he also curated um, the concentration camps exhibition. We did a survey to think about, you know, what the difference is between in-person and digital programming at a small center like ours. And I think our assumption was that as long as we had a website, the young people, students would reach out to that and that would be enough. And that, in fact, it would be our older community members who really wanted to come back to the space. And it was actually the opposite that, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the students, they felt like, sure, you have a website. Great. But coming to the space, mm -hmm. feeling what it feels like or being asked to kind of be in a space where you're surrounded by this kind of imagery and this kind of content, which is very difficult to mm -hmm. engage with, even for us who work there, um, was a really significant insight. So I just want to thank you for talking about your experience with the students and your own experience. I think that's so important, especially as scholars in this field. We frequently don't place ourselves 
in the conversation and it is very affecting and um, just really grateful. And thank you so much, Jody, for moderating and inviting Rebecca to come speak with us today as part of the colloquium. Thank, thank you all to who watched. I know we put in the chat. Our next event is for Kristallnacht, which is taking place next week on November 9th at 6 p.m. And a recording of this video that's closed caption will be available on our website within about a week. Thank you to everyone. We hope you stay safe and be well. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.